Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host as we answer those gardening questions. We've got another great show for you tonight. Do keep in mind, we still aren't taking those phone calls. You can still submit those pictures and questions, however, for a future show. Send us that email at byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much as you can about that question. And as always, tell us where you live. Be sure to check us out on our social media pages, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. As always, we're gonna start the show with samples, and Rock, you are up. All right, Kim, thank you. This is um, a plant that many of you recognize, um, yellow nutsedge. It's kind of the bane of humanity for, for many of us. Um, but what I wanted to do is I've had viewers say, well, you know, you always talk about the triangular stem. And then as soon as we get done with that little demo, we'll, uh, we'll tell you how to control this little beast. But down at the base, if you look at the base of this, at the stem, it's very much triangular. Let me see if I can get that in a way. Yeah, see that? Perfect, great camera work, thank you. Um, so that's triangular, it's rather than square like a mint or you know, hollow like some of our other species and stuff like that. So that's that key identifier to tell sedges from other weeds. Sedges have edges, is something that I tell my students. But that said, um, now is the time to get it. We want to get it controlled at about the three to five leaf stage. It's right about the five leaf, five leaf stage right now. Just count the leaves, it's pretty simple, right? We've got five leaves on this particular plant. And the reason you wanna get them early is that if you wait too long, when it gets into the seven, 10, sometimes even as much as 11 leaves, then it's, it's already produced the tubers that are gonna cause a problem next year or germinate later this, this year. So you wanna catch it in that five leaf stage, come in with something like a sedge hammer product or there's a number of other products out there and then hit it again in three weeks. We've got really good results, almost nearly 100% control by being consistently early in the year rather than later. Um, uh, and if it's in the turf, you know, you, you wait till you can really see it, that's waiting a little bit longer than you should. So get it now where you remember where they are, hit it early and hit it again in about three weeks. Excellent. Lauren. Well, I love that sample rock. I harvested about two five gallon buckets of that in my flower beds. <laughs> Everybody loves it. Oh, but it's pull when it's wet. Oh, thank you. Because the other thing is you can pull it this time of year. Mm -hmm. But if you wait too long to pull it, so if you've just got a few like you did in your flower bed, um, you know, in the turf you can do that as well. When it's just young, you pull it, you're not going to get another plant there. But if you wait too long, you're just instigating further growth. So thanks for jogging my memory. Yeah. Lots of fun, though, pulling it. So. Five-gallon buckets. Yeah. That's not Five -gallon just Five-gallon buckets. A few. I got a few. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, show tonight uh, a turf disease that we're right on the front end of. And I think as we see, and this is brown patch, and if you've watched the show in the past, you've heard us talk about this, and you can see here on the leaf blades, these irregular margin lesions that don't all the time go all the way across the blade, like you can see here. And sometimes they'll go across, but you see that nice dark margin. This is a disease that is, is favored and is mostly prevalent in fescues, but we will see it in bluegrass if it's a real severe year. But right now, it's just starting. And when we get next week, when we have our temperatures, when we get night temperatures over 70 degrees, specifically 75, wonderful time for brown patch to develop. So this is something you're gonna see, a few things you can do to, to help alleviate the problem uh, up front is, is make sure your ir irrigation is going on in the morning time. So you're irrigating in the morning. Uh, you're not fertilizing during the heat of the year. Uh, I know Rock wouldn't recommend that anyway, but. Uh, that's something to do. And then there are fungicides that you can use in severe cases, uh, but many times this will just thin the yard a little bit and you can get by with overseeding in the fall. So you will see some hose-in sprayers and we talk about this in our fungicide video a little bit later uh, on some things to use too. All right, thank you, Lauren. John, black licorice, absolute favorite. <laughs> right, so I have this, you know, it, it looks like, you know, it could be like a long strand of black licorice, but actually this is drip irrigation tubing. And I brought this this evening to talk about, you know, as we get into the heat of the summer, we've already had a lot of heat and a lot of dry, except for this little rainstorm that we had in, in part of the state um, this week. So it's getting really hard to make sure everything stays watered. And we know that's one of the keys to success. So this drip irrigation tubing, I actually bought this kit for my vegetable garden uh, and uh, each, there's little bumps along the way and you see little holes in there. I don't know. Every, all of us have like these teeny tiny little samples tonight that we've got to like really zoom <laughs> in on. Um, but there's a little teeny tiny hole here 
And as water runs through this and builds up pressure, that teeny tiny little hole will put out one gallon of water per hour. <laughs> Uh, and so this goes all along my garden and you calculate out how much you need. And it's about, uh, we need about an inch or so of rain at least through the week. Uh, and that's roughly about 0 0.6, 0 0.625 gallons per week at least uh, in the garden. And so this is handy so you don't have to get out there and spray and get that water everywhere. So you, then you get the diseases and you don't lose to evaporation. Uh, it's also good if you're forgetful or lazy uh, because then you can get a timer and you can just have it water itself. Uh, and I even went fancy this year. Uh, my timer is actually a smart timer. So it actually connects to the internet and it looks at the weather and it waters according to if it's gonna be hot and dry or if it's gonna rain that day, it's not gonna water because it waters at 6 a.m. Uh, and so uh, you can do that, or you can also use mulch, and my favorite mulch is shredded newspaper. So we use that in my garden, uh, you know, just recycling. It's a great project, just get a paper shredder if you have kids or uh, people that need a project to do on a, on, a, on a lazy day. You know, some of us put our mother-in-laws to doing this, <laughs> and that's a good project for her. Uh, scissors, right, with the mother-in-laws? Yeah, you can do yeah, the little embroidery scissors. <laughs> you, know, you want fine detail. Now you guys are just being mean. <laughs> 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 all right, <laughs> good ideas from all of you on your samples. Okay, Rock, you get the uh, first set of pictures. The first one here is a viewer who says, how does she get rid of Japanese knotweed that creeps over from her neighbor's yard? Kim, that's a really good question. I'm gonna start by saying Japanese knotweed is that one that comes up early in the year. It looks like uh, asparagus spears, right? And it's got kind of a reddish color to it. But once, you know, once it takes hold, it's really aggressive. It's actually a noxious weed and classified as such. It was marketed as an ornamental for years. Right, so unfortunately there's a lot of it out there, um, but it is so aggressive and so difficult to control. If you want to use, the, you know, the rumor has it you can smother it, but I find that kind of intriguing because it can actually lay buried for up to 10, 15 years. So that's not gonna do it. So you're gonna probably have to go the herbicide route. You know, cutting it back isn't gonna work, it's just gonna continue. And every time you cut some of these really aggressive species like that back, they come back and they bring their friends, right? So you don't wanna do that either. So you're probably gonna have to use a fairly aggressive herbicide approach and keep it off the desirables. Something that has triclopyr in it, um, the ortho uh, um, uh, poison ivy treatment, it has triclopyr in it. That's one that I would recommend, but you can just look at the label and look for triclopyr. You wanna get as much of the leaf as you can covered and you wanna do it on a cooler day, early morning, so it has all day to translocate down to the stems and that sort of thing. But Japanese knotweed is just unbelievably Awful. hard to control. Okay, so now you have a couple others that are uh, probably up there too. The, the, uh, this viewer knows what he has. It's pokeweed and uh, a trumpet vine. And uh, how do we uh, control those? So we're not gonna be easy tonight. Is that what's going on yeah, today? No. You know, so, mm -hmm. so pokeweed, um, very aggressive. Can, I, I've heard rumors that it can get up to like 16, 17 feet. Um, can have some woody growth on it. Um, that's one. That's the one in the back, the larger, large leaf one, and in the foreground is trumpet vine. Uh, both of these are aggressive broadleaf plants. So once again, using a herbicide can be recommended. The interesting thing about pokeweed, though, is that you can actually control it with boiling water if it hasn't got. I'm excuse me, trumpet vine. You can actually control it with boiling water when it's in its smaller stage, like it is in this picture here. You get boiling water, you put it on there, it basically toasts it. It actually works relatively well. And you know me, I'm a nozzle head. So if <laughs> we're recommending something that's non-synthetic uh, non herbicide, um, that works. And if you get on the internet, they'll give you a couple of examples of how that works. And there's actually data from some people down in Tennessee that shows that that works. Triclopyr, on, um, excuse me, on, on the other hand, the pokeweed, <clears throat> you're gonna have to hit it young and early in the season with once again, something that's got triclopyr the herbicide triclopyr in it. And if you look at the more aggressive broadleaf herbicides, they'd have it. 2,4-D won't do a thing to this. Dicamba definitely won't do a thing to this. You need to go with the more aggressive broadleaf herbicides. All right, and your third picture, I think, is pokeweed again in a larger, yep, that's pokeweed. So. Yeah, the, when we start to get to this stage, you know, leaf yeah. coverage is a problem. That's a really, that one's moving out a little bit. and and. You know, it's got a, it, the, the berries on it, one of the control measures is when it gets berries on it, the berries are red and they produce prolific amount of seed. And then it'll re-sprout itself from, from the main plant, but then every one of those seeds, the germination rates on pokeweed are something like 70, 80%, and they produce about six, 700 seeds per pod. So yeah, keep that in mind. Don't let it go to seed. 
Um, they're toxic to horses. They're toxic. Well, they're actually toxic to every mammal, including humans. But birds love them. So birds apparently can digest them. And then guess what? It's a red berry that they process through their system. And guess where that red berry ends up? On your white car. On your white car or on your sidewalk or on your white siding. So oh, okay. try to get it. Don't let it fruit. Try to get it controlled now before it starts to fruit. All right. I, I, see, I see food when I see pokeweed. Rock. I grew up right. on pokeweed salad, Poke, so. Yep. But the leaves are not it. toxic. Yeah, yeah you boil, have to boil it. Yeah, oh, yeah that's boil exactly it. right. And you take yeah. the toxin out of it. But I can't say I've ever tasted pokeweed salad, but I, I do love some um, ergot and <laughs> corn. <laughs> All right, anybody with pokeweed, bring it to Lauren and he'll feed rock. It has to be young. You can't eat the older leaves yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the young stuff. All How right. many qualifiers? It's like a mushroom. <laughs> Your <laughs> first one, Lauren, we had a discussion yep. on, and you're going to talk about what is a disease and what isn't. Yeah. Uh, and this is a grapevine that has, you can see on the top, you, you might think this is powdery mildew or something mm -hmm. else, uh, but the discoloration on the top, and then we'll look at the underside, and it has little blisters on it. Uh, and this is grape phylloxera. And mm -hmm. phylloxera is actually an insect, so... Uh, well, that's an insect. I'm going to tell our viewer that has this to look up grape phylloxera, and you can see some management with insecticides on there and timing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we're looking at here. All right. So again, one of those is it an insect? Is it mm -hmm. a disease? This is this is actually yep. an insect that's causing this. Excellent. So. Your second one here is uh, a Western Plymouth, Nebraska viewer wondering what is wrong with uh, Western Iowa, sorry, peach tree. What's wrong with her peach? Yeah, and so if you look closely at this on the end, on the right side of the screen, you can see some blistery leaves. And this is peach leaf curl. Uh, we had a really good spring for this. Anytime we get a spring where we have our, our tree buds coming out and breaking dormancy, and then we go back into colder temperatures, that's the perfect <laughs> conditions for tephrina, the fungus that infects that little developing bud and gets in the leaf tissue and deforms it like this. We also may have viewers that are seeing this on oak trees because there mm -hmm. is an oak uh, leaf curl as well. So mm -hmm. uh, management on this, nothing now. You do a dormant application before bud break. All right, so again, one of those, we better talk about this mm -hmm. on the winter show. Yeah, this would be a good winter show one. All right, and you have one more that actually could have come in from about 10 viewers. <clears throat> Well, and we, and we think this is leaf drop with scab. Uh, a lot of our flowering crab apples right now, uh, we're seeing a, a lot of uh, fungal disease activity and scab is our number one that we tend to see on that. If we look at trying to manage this, most of our trees will be fine with it. If you have a young tree that you're establishing, hopefully you used a tree that is resistant to scab. That's one thing you'd wanna select if you're still in that tree selection market. And the other one is if you have it, a uh, younger tree and you're trying to establish and it was susceptible, you could use a fungicide on it, but it's really not warranted for our larger trees unless you just want to have a, a perfect landscape and not have any yellow leaves. All right, thank you, Lauren. All right, you have a couple. Actually, you had two viewers send in pictures. We're just using one set here, uh, but this is a knockout rose that apparently has grown two separate stems and it's producing two different types of flowers. And uh, we had another viewer who was, uh, th that one's Fremont. We had another one that was Lincoln who essentially sent the same thing with a different rose. So mm -hmm. what do we have going on and how do we manage that? So we can have one of two things going on. So it could be either a sport, which is like a genetic mutation where something new and exciting happens uh, and you get something interesting going on or more likely it's called a reversion and that's also a genetic thing that's going on and what happens is uh, the way that we get a lot of new plants these days is that a breeder will look at a, a tree or something and they will see hey this rose has this interesting thing growing on it like just like that they might someone might find a rose with a, a weird branch and they really like it they take that cutting, they, they put it on a rootstock, they breed it out, and they develop a rose from that sport that was on that plant. And then some years later, as we've uh, you know, sold a lot of them, uh, sometimes the conditions are right and the genetics just happen that it reverts back to that parent plant. And so you're getting that, that weird growth. So um, if you like it, leave it. If you don't, cut it out. <laughs> right, exactly. And you have your next picture um, this is really interesting because we've had more than one call about this. This is actually tricolor beach and what it's supposed to look like. Your second picture is what it's doing. So same thing? 
It's the same thing. So this is a reversion. So that would have come from, uh, you know, some sort of sport or mutation on a tree that someone cut off. They thought it was interesting. Uh, and now it's probably, you know, if we're seeing that a lot in these, these types of beech trees, then it's probably that, you know, that parent material wasn't that stable to begin with. Uh, and so it, it will happen. So it's, it's just a, a reversion back to those old genetics. So you can cut it out or, I mean, if you like to have a, you know, a, a tree or a rose that looks weird, then keep it. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Well, a few weeks ago, we heard from Jody Green about what to look for on a pesticide label. Tonight, we're going to take that one step further. We're going to examine a fungicide label. So here's Lauren to tell us more about that. Earlier this season, Jody visited with you about insecticides, and today we're gonna to spend a little time on fungicides. Um, but before we do, I wanna emphasize a few critical things whenever you're gonna use a fungicide. Many times in our landscape, we really don't need these products, and we can get away with uh, using other management techniques so we're not introducing chemicals to the landscape. So as we look at these products, we'll go through that. The first one uh, I wanna talk about, and really we're a little bit past the window when you protect uh, for this disease, but any of you that were dealing with summer patch, or necrotic ring spot in your lawn. Uh, making a fungicide application with a granular product and then watering it in, uh, this would be a product that we'd use for that. Specifically, this one has thionephanate methyl in it. And that product is one that becomes systemic. So it's absorbed in the root system and then it's taken up into the plant, okay? We water it in because in, in the case of necrotic ring spot or summer patch, we're gonna to try to get that product in so it's protecting the roots and it's absorbed in the root tissue. Another application that we could see uh, in a lawn setting or ornamentals, uh, this is a product where we've got one of our easy to connect hose in applicators. Uh, so with this product, there's no mixing. Um, you just take this, hook it to the hose, and, and then you've got a spray application. This is one that's a systemic fungicide. Also, this one has propiconazole, a product you hear us reference many times on Backyard Farmer. Now, Propiconazole is a, is a product that is systemic and can be used for a lot of different diseases. Uh, but again, this is one that would hit in that, in that landscape ornamental uh, and, and turf disease management space. Uh, the other thing that we wanna pay attention to on these products is to look at the pre-harvest interval for anything that we're gonna use a product for that is gonna be uh, going into uh, a food production or food system. So for example, in this product, uh, it's not gonna be labeled for food production. It's only labeled for non-bearing apple trees, for example. So you could spray your apple trees before they're in fruit production with this particular. We also have one here that this is a product that is very common in the fungicide market, chlorothalonil. This one is funginil, uh, but there are many other products that could be similar with the same active ingredient. So today I'm showing you a few just for example purposes, but when you look at that active ingredient, for example, here with chlorothalonil, you could find that in many, many other packaged products that would be labeled and, and their brand name would be different. So when we look at this one, this one has a lot more diversity and, and shows clearly the different uh, PHIs or pre-harvest interval days. Another one just to finish up is an organic product that's uh, a sulfur product. Now coppers and sulfurs, are typically the products that we see used widely in organic production, and many of you use those in your backyard gardens. This is a product that could actually be dusted onto the plant, or it could actually be applied with a liquid uh, solution. So you can mix the product up, it has a label uh, identification for how much to put per gallon, and uh, will, will result in the same control. So when you're working with fungicides in your landscape, make sure that you're always reading and following those label directions. The label specifies the amount of, of product to use, how to make that application to effectively manage the disease, and all those pre-harvest interval and restrictions. It is so important to read and understand everything on those labels. And as Lauren said, you need to know what the problem is first before you can treat it effectively. Don't treat grape phylloxera with a fungicide. Exactly, and, and there's just a <laughs> lot of information there. So that was just kind of a small spattering of what you need to know. So <laughs> exactly, <laughs> a lot to learn. All right, Rock, your first one here is uh, from Imperial, and this has invaded her buffalo grass lawn. 
<clears throat> excuse me, last year it almost completely took over. It's a cool season, about the same time as cheatgrass. It's dead by mid-July, so she gave us really a lot of good information. She, she, uh, she did spray the entire uh, buffalo grass with Roundup in April. Okay, so um, this is Little Barley, which is a winter annual, just like she described. So thanks to mm -hmm. the viewer for doing that. And, and it is, you know, an analogous to cheat gas or downy brome because it germinates in the in the fall of the year and over winters and then comes up in the spring going gangbusters. Mm -hmm. um, it really is very difficult to control once it's been through the winter. So April, you know, kudos to them for thinking about, well, we'll spray over the top before the buffalo grass breaks dormancy, but at the same time, um, it's almost next to impossible to control little barley at that point. Fall applications um, of, of some of the graminicides or that sort of thing, or even the best bet is pre-emergence herbicides in the fall of the year. So September would be a really good time to do it. And if it, you don't get it all with pre-emergent, the product Tenacity will control it when it's very young. So those are your options, but it should really be done September, maybe early October. And then if you've already had some germination, go in there with an application of Tenacity. And all of those are labeled for buffalo grass. So that's what I would do because it is germinating in the fall and not the spring. All right, excellent. Your second one is a Lincoln viewer who is, uh, she's got this going on and she wonders what that is and how to control it. So I, 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 you know, I looked at this a little closer. Um, I think this is quack grass. It's a fairly aggressive um, grass, and I see that the ligule and oracle structures that we look at to identify grasses, but I would not bet my house on that, right? It, mm -hmm. There's not enough there. I need a seed head, and I need a close-up. You know, I hate to do this to the viewer, but I need a close-up of where the leaf meets the sheath and that structure right there, that's called the ligule and oracle area. Um, if we can see that, then we can definitively say that it's quack grass or something else. But right now, I'm guessing this is quack grass. All right, and your next one, this is a Norfolk viewer. Um, and he looked out to see every single bit of his lawn looking, and I think the second picture shows this. It looked like totally pockmarked. It's birds feeding. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, I think the some people will think, well, that's skunks out rooting about. Skunks they literally roll the sod, the mm -hmm. turf back like sod, and skunks just tear it up. But it would be much more aggressively fed in on that. And you know, when we've had the rains, and maybe that, you know, I'm, where was that? Imperial Norfolk or Norfolk. So they've had some rain. It'll bring the worms to the surface, and the birds will just come in and they'll peck all around. And when they do that, they rough it up. It should recover fine. But that's bird feeding. It's simply a, a very small aeration. Sure, we'll call it <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stay in your zone, Kim. Stay in the zone. <laughs> Stay in the zone. <laughs> All right, Lauren, let's see. You have, your first one here is two or three viewers sent this into. This is the Tall Garden Phlox. Um, and it is, yes, we have phlox plant bug going on, but they're really more worried about what's happening with the crowns of the plants. Yeah, in this particular case, this is a nice example. I don't know if we can go back to that full plant view uh, with the picture, but this is a nice example of a plant that has a root and crown rot because you can see that bottom up effect in the distribution on the plant. And, and that's usually mm. what type of symptom we see when we're getting a root or crown, root and crown rot uh, with it. Many times with phlox, we see powdery mildew and other things, but in this case, I'm gonna say it's, it's more of a root, or crown, root and crown rot. Uh, it may be if it's in a site where it's too wet, uh, mm -hmm. That could be an option, uh, or it may just be one that has succumbed for other reasons. Uh, but it, not really anything you can do with a root and crown rot at this point. Uh, it may be an opportunity to replace it, or maybe you can baby it and get it through it. All right, and, and, and if somebody does want to replace, they really shouldn't replace in the same spot. R right, right in the same spot, you're yeah. going to have a lot of inoculum from the fungus that killed this plant, so you might decide to have another plant, or think back, and if there was something that stressed this plant, all right. Maybe it got a herbicide drift. Maybe it had, you know, whatever. All those things can make a plant succumb to fungi that are in the soil All and right. then result in these problems. Excellent. And your next two, actually we had several viewers who sent us this. First one's Omaha, and that's about a 10-year-old one. And your second one is uh, Carney, and they're over 20 years old. <laughs> if, if I could solve this, I would retire probably. <laughs> right? So the, the problem with uh, clematis, so many times you see the yellowing on the leaves like this, and, mm -hmm. and this can be so many problems uh, that can cause this. So I, I hate to say to try to do anything with treating. Uh, many times we talk about trying to make sure that the roots are shaded, uh, make sure it's mulched properly, uniform moisture. 
uh, these types of things for Clematis, but I'm not going to go down the disease trail with that one. No, and, and I don't think we ever have, actually. No, we get this every it's, single it's year. so much. They're just, yeah. They can tend to be problematic, and many times you'll see that with a Clematis. So. All right. Thank you, Lauren. You have some ID. Uh, your first one, this is actually a few miles west of Kearney. It's a wooded area. She's got mulberry plums. She noticed these shrubs that have thorns, white flowers, and now little green fruit. She thinks it's gooseberries. And she is correct. <laughs> so <laughs> those are gooseberries. Uh, they're wonderful fruit. Um, they're very um, tart. Uh, mm -hmm. You got to let them ripen a little bit, bit more. They're a little green there. But yeah, so thorns. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That is a gooseberry leaf shape. Mm -hmm. That is a gooseberry. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So enjoy. <laughs> enjoy. Yes. <laughs> Your second one is um, maybe I, you got this because it could be something else, but you know what it is. I believe I do know what it is. Yes. I, if anyone else here on the panel can correct me, I don't know. Um, so this occurs a lot in vegetable gardens. It is a weed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very pretty. You see those purple flowers and then it'll have this really dark colored berry mm -hmm. that forms on it. This, I believe, is black nightshade. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very interesting plant. It's a plant you don't really want, especially um, if you have uh, children that like to sample things <laughs> because the fruit and the green part of the plant are poisonous. So that it's a net nightshade. Uh, it's related to the deadly nightshade. It is not, quote, the deadly nightshade, um, but it is close. Uh, and interesting, a lot of these are called belladonna. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, so belladonna in Italian means beautiful lady. And why are these deadly plants called beautiful ladies? Well, it's because back in the day, beautiful ladies would take the sap or the juice from these berries and drop it in their eyes to make their pupils big and so that they would have these big, beautiful eyes. <laughs> Before they went blind. Perfectly. Before they went blind, you know. <laughs> oh my <so>. goodness. <laughs> yeah, so she wants to get rid of that and this is a pretty common yeah, one. Yeah, just pull it out. Yeah, and your also, third. Also toxic to plants too, right? Or to uh, pets, right? Yes. Pets, yeah. Yeah, yeah, about everything. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't eat it, don't sample it. But it's primarily a um, gut, reactor, right? It's, it doesn't have, an, it's not the sap or anything. My understanding is, is that it's ingestion is what's going to do, yeah. do you right, yes. yeah. right, right. You have a third one actually, John. This is somebody who has a ribbon grass, uh, the striped ribbon grass. Uh, she's, she's put Roundup on it twice and then some of people came and dug it up for their own flower gardens and now she's thinking she's got it. Does she got it or does she get to get it again? And oh, again and again. those kinds of things are, <laughs> you know, those rhizomatous, I mean, there's, there's just so many roots and rhizomes in there that you could probably see it again. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, you can keep, you know, cutting it down, digging it out, spraying it. You could even try like the old, you know, like bury it deep method, like put it like a foot of mulch on top of it mm -hmm. and see if you can smother it out. Mm -hmm. But there's likelihood that you're gonna still have it. Get to do it again, mm -hmm. all right. Well, we did finally get our garden planted this week. There are still a few plants that need to go into the ground. We're off to a really good start. So let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, Mother Nature has been very good to us. Almost the whole entire garden is planted. We still have um, a couple of stuff in the donation garden to get in, but pretty much all is done. What we're gonna do next is we have our leaf um, debris that we collected last fall. That's been stored all winter. We're gonna bring that down. And then the entire annual area will get about two inches of leaf debris for our mulch. That's going to help eliminate any of that soil splash up so we won't have any kind of diseases or any kind of anything like that. And it will add more organic matter into our garden, which is really great for our soil. So we have color in our garden now, we have vegetables in our garden now, and now all we need is some sunlight, a little bit of extra rain, and a great summer to start harvesting our vegetables and flowers. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, it is time for lightning. You ready, John? I am ready. 
This is the Stapleton viewer who lost a third of their asparagus patch this year and so did most of their neighbors. They're wondering why. Could be you have voles in the area, could have, uh, I don't know, that's probably my best guess would be voles. <laughs> all right, we have oaks, we have ash, we have all sorts of trees that are losing single leaves. What is that all about? So if it's just single leaves, a few of them, it's not anything to be worried about, changes in the weather. Um, you know, if it's a lot of them, then it could be a, a fungal or other disease issue. All right, this is a viewer who has garden hoses with brass fittings. And he's wonder, is it, wondering, is it safe to let the water run through those brass fitting hoses and put it on vegetables? Yeah, there should be no problem with that. There's actually more risk from the actual hoses than from the brass fittings. All right, this is a Lawrence, Nebraska viewer who said he got no flowers on his Japanese iris in one location and got a few in the other. What's up with that? Uh, could be that uh, there were some weather issues. Could be that some of them were planted like mulch too deeply and they had to come up through there. Uh, so there could be some issues like that going on. All right, nice job. You don't get to pass on all your questions. <laughs> I gotta win. <laughs> I gotta win. Thank your time. All right, are you Thorough answer. are you ready, Lauren? Ready as my homemade deer salami. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, would too much fertilizer cause the tops of tomato plants to curl? Could. <laughs> 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 this is a Lexington viewer who has a white powdery covering on their turf on the north side of a pine. What is that? That's uh, powdery mildew. And their question is, of course, what to do about it. Answer number three then would be uh, for powdery mildew, you can actually just use water and spray the plant. That can help a lot as an organic uh, solution. There are fungicides you could use. All right. Uh, this is an Elkhorn viewer who has what they call orange eggs on their buckthorn plant, but it's not eggs. It's a rust. And what do they do about that on their buckthorn? On their buckthorn, they have to watch when it's coming in and you can spray a fungicide when it's coming in. And I think on buckthorn, it's probably gonna be one of the native grasses that may cycle. All right, this is a Phelps County viewer that has canker in her spruce. Uh, she knows she has to cut it out. She's wondering, will it spread to her other spruce trees? I could. And so what does she do about that? <laughs> Just continue. <laughs> it could. Uh, continue with sanitation, three to five inches below the affected area. Uh, once the tree gets to where it's uh, not looking like something you want, you're gonna have to take Off it. Off with its head. Yeah. All right. Okay, are you ready? Like lunch meat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the type of glove and the mills that we use for the glove of death? So you start with a, like a dishwashing glove that's not pervious to water or liquid, and then you put a cotton glove over that. Then you spray the non-selective herbicide on the white cotton glove, or the, it doesn't have to be white, and then you use that to wipe it on the material that you're trying to kill. All right, uh, would 30% vinegar work rather than glyphosate or? If you worked really hard at it, you'd be able to, but you'd have to do it, the, the data says five to six times with, with uh, um, herbicidal vinegar versus uh, one or two times with glyphosate. All right, do you have to throw the glove away when you're finished? Now you can wash, wash it off and you know, dispose of the water in, you know, in, in a space that it's not gonna cause a problem, but no, right. they don't have to be thrown away. Do, do you do this in certain temperature ranges? Uh, generally, you're gonna get the most activity out of a non-selective from about 65 to about 75, 80. All right, can, will it work on baby trees and Russian sage? Uh, it'll work on both, but you just have to be persistent. All right, how do you get rid of aspen sprouts in your yard? This is a valley viewer. Um, you could hit it with glyphosate because it won't translocate to the mother plant. Okay, not bad, but did you guys tie? I think you I tied. demand a recount. I think I had seven, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> but yours, right. yours were all spoon fed. It was like one question. Yeah. <laughs> She sent. Wow. <laughs> different, definitely favoritism. I'm, I'm, yes. gone, I'm gone for six years. I come back and you guys got me. <laughs> mm, yeah. All right, John, what do we have for Just plants of the week? Just waiting for you to come back. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have for plants of the week? Okay, so we have a few plants of the week. I'm color coordinated here mm -hmm. uh, with our plants of the week. So this is uh, Prairie Gypsy Monarda, which is a bee balm. Uh, and so we see that and we also have wild bergamot. Uh, which they're, they're the same plant, just different. You know, we have the, the wild one and then we have the one that's uh, the cultivar, the lighter one there. 
So they're both blooming now. Bees love them. Uh, all pollinators love them, really. Uh, the native one is a little bit more susceptible to powdery mildew than the, the bread cultivar. Uh, and they're in the rain garden here. So they're, they're good for, you know, they can be a little drier, but they can take a little wetness. They're on the edge of the rain garden. And then down here at the bottom, we have the Kent Bell Bellflower. So which is a more of a shade plant. You'll see, you know, the bells will open up uh, to about two inches, so they're not quite open. There's one there that's opening a little bit. Uh, and it's rhizomatous, meaning it'll spread out, uh, but it doesn't become invasive. So those are, those are our plants of the week. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, Rock, your set of questions. So this is a Lincoln viewer that has this particular weed low to the ground. You can, he can't cut it off. It doesn't like bare ground. It spreads thickly, little tiny yellow flowers. Uh, he tried some 2,4-D on it, but that didn't work. Difficult to rogue out. What is it and how do you control it? So it's Black Medic, and <clears throat> um, Black Medic is an annual. It's a summer annual. Um, it can be controlled with um, some of the pre-emergent herbicides, which is far better than putting 2,4-D out when it could possibly drift onto, non, onto your desirable plants. Um, but it's got to be something that has, it's the, the commercial name is Barricade or the um, si the Come the Pemelden name is Prodiamine. It does a pretty good job on black medic and has a long residual. Um, it's also a legume, so it fixes its own nitrogen, um, and all that means is that it makes it really competitive in a turf stand. In a turf stand, especially if the turf is a little bit on the low end of the fertility range, you can control it now with a product that either has dicamba or something other than 2,4-D in it, because most of the legumes do not respond to uh, 2,4-D. All right, and your second one, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is Central Lincoln, and she says this is a pretty little thing. What is it? Yeah, this is thimbleberry, um, which is in the same family as raspberry and that sort of thing, but it really doesn't produce an edible fruit. I'm, maybe it does, I'm not positive of that. It's actually a really desirable plant. It's pretty and, and isn't, you know, not in that location probably, so they could transplant it. Um, they wanted to get rid of it. I think you could just clip it off on the base and you might get a little bit of regrowth, but I don't think a herbicide's needed to get rid of this one based on, that's a relatively hostile looking location to me against the side of a house and um, kind of a rock thing going on down below there. So based on that picture, I would say a clip and you're done if, unless they want to keep it and it's pretty hardy, so it might look pretty good, but that's thimbleberry. All right. Okay, Lauren, you ready? This is a Chapman, Nebraska viewer, uh, two 80-year-old hackberry trees. They've been a little slower to leaf out this year. They're putting on leaves, they're dropping some, but then they have these clusters of these leafy stems. They don't know of any unusual herbicide use. What is this? Now, this is something that can happen in our hackberries, <laughs> and uh, this is a witch's broom, which is just a proliferation of, of buds that develop uh, from a mite that gets into the bud mm -hmm. and, and through its feeding, I think, results in that uh, proliferation of the bud material. And then you get these little clusters of stems as this continues to grow. Um, I would, in this case, just if they can, recommend you could just prune it out mm -hmm. simply. Um, many times you'll see these associated with powdery mildew on the tree, so they'll get development, they'll have the leaves, and then you'll see uh, more powdery mildew in that little pocket mm -hmm. on the tree, but uh, just simply prune them out and that should be fine. All right, your, your second set, uh, this is a Council Bluffs viewer, has a hawthorn that has this problem every year. They've treated it with a fungicide that didn't help. And then you have your next picture is actually apples. Uh, and this is Lincoln with essentially the same thing going on. So this one has me a little stumped, but, but Kim, when you said that they treat it with a fungicide that didn't do anything, that, that may be a clue here. So mm -hmm. if this is on every year and you're just seeing it in, in the lower portion of the tree or section of the tree, and it's not the whole tree, and I believe this could be uh, a bacterial blight of mm -hmm. some sort, almost like a fire blight, but it's not the fire blight organism. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, next spring, if, if possible, if that tree is in a zone where you have any irrigation or anything and you can redirect that, and that would be something I'd recommend. Uh, and then just to confirm it, in this case, I would recommend maybe sending a sample in. Uh, it's not a fungal disease from what uh, I can tell from the picture, 
Uh, but it could be some sort of a bacterial leaf blight. So when you say redirect, blight. redirect away? Away, so away you're not from. watering over the right. tree, because that could right. aggravate it. But many times in the spring, that's hard to do, right? Because right? it's raining. Right. And, and are we accepting samples yet, or not quite yeah, yet? It's still not right yeah. now. So, yeah. so we'll have to wait uh, on It's that. more difficult. So yeah, you have to wait. But for <coughs> sure, you, you, well. Next year. Next year, you could. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's OK. Next yeah. year will come. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you have a peach question, uh, and this is actually a, uh, a peach tree that uh, is loaded with fruit. So what should happen if you are fortunate enough to have either a peach or an apple that is loaded? Well, you don't want it to be loaded. Um, so <coughs> seeing those clusters of fruit, it's beautiful, and you think, oh, I'm going to have these giant clusters of all these fruit when they're ripe. But actually what happens is if we have too many fruits on the tree and too many fruits in one area, we can have different problems going on. So too many fruits on the tree in general means that the, the fruits are very small uh, overall. So we want to reduce the number of fruits on the tree overall. Having multiples in one area gives us a few other problems. So the branches could be too heavy, they'll break. Um, maybe even like make it easier since we have some airflow issues with diseases or they'll mi be misshapen. So you actually want to reduce those out on peaches. You don't want to have them in clusters and you want each peach to be at least five inches away from every other peach. 10% mm -hmm. of the load is considered a full peach load. Yes. 10%. 10%. Ten <laughs> five inches, not six, not four. Five. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So to get the ruler out. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> yes. All right, your second picture is actually a, a <laughs> hibiscus, you know, one of the tropicals. She's worried about the yellowing leaves, but she's more worried about how do you get your hibiscus to flower? So, I mean, the, the yellowing leaves, those could be a few different issues. If it's just the bottom leaves, it could be a nutrient deficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, could be some sort of shock if you bought it this year and moved it. You know, we, we get those things. So I'm and just seeing those few, it's not as worrying. If you're, if you're seeing like brown spots in amongst the yellow, you could have a disease going on. So be on the lookout for that. Um, getting it to flower, you know, just keeping it happy. Um, if you fertilize it, don't give it too much nitrogen. Uh, keep it watered, keep it happy. It should flower on its own. All right, and your third one, can I ask John a follow-up question sure. about the peach? So if I had a branch that was 10 inches long <laughs> and there were two peaches on the end that were two inches apart, should I thin that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> From both sides of the house. Okay. All right. Just check it. <laughs> Your next question, uh, John, is about ginger, wild ginger, so our, our native ground cover. Uh, it spread. She, she thinks perhaps that uh, it needs to be divided. Does it need to, and if so, when would she do that? I mean, you can divide it, so it, it's a ground cover, so it'll keep spreading, so if you wanted to just keep spreading there, if you wanna to dig some up and move it, that's fine. Uh, do it when, it when it's dormant or in spring or fall. We don't really wanna move stuff when stuff's actively growing. Uh, number one, it can give it shock. Number two, when it gets really hot and dry, it's really hard to keep things watered, especially if the roots aren't developed. All right, thank you, John. Well, last week we saw some good vine choices for you to try. They can offer you structure, color, interesting texture. You also have to keep an eye on them so they don't take over the world. For our second feature tonight, we're going to give you some tips on keeping those vines in place. A few shows ago, we talked about how to choose and use vines in your landscape. Let's talk now about how to control some of these beasts that can really get out of control if you're not paying attention. I wanna start with clematis because people love the big purple flowered ones. This happens to be sweet autumn clematis, which is on the invasive species list and wasn't planted here. A lot of the vines that you end up with in your landscape may be a gift from a bird. People will see variegated forms of plants like woodbine or trumpet vine in the garden centers or online. They'll read some of the beautiful attributes of those vines and then a year or two or three or five or ten years later, we will get the call saying, how do I control this? This is completely out of control. Another one is the bittersweet that we talked about that will sneak its way into other locations come up and really form a colony. 
And probably one of the worst ones is a ground cover because if you think about what vines do, we talk about them sleeping and then creeping and then leaping. Some of the vines, especially many of the ones that climb with their adventitious roots, they'll hit something vertical and they'll go straight up. So this is actually purple leaf winter creeper. What you will see with it is it starts life as a ground cover and this piece that I pulled up has set down roots at almost every single node. So it's going to creep along the ground, get into all of your landscape beds and then go vertical. The way we have to control a lot of these aggressive vines like trumpet creeper if you want them in your landscape is you have to be aggressive about pruning. Do not let the vines that are supposed to go up decide they want to go out. So watch for all of those horizontal trailing stems. Don't let them root down. Get them out of the landscape as soon as you can. If you are stuck in a situation where they have really taken hold and rooted, pull them up, get them out, prune them off. You may have to resort to herbicides to be able to totally get rid of some of them. And the herbicides have to be a broadleaf, so there are some that are uh, glyphosate as an example, triclopyr is another one. You may have to resort to what we call the glove of death in some situations, because if you look at a colony of plants like this, you'll see that we have all sorts of plants in here that we might want as vines, and then we have the ones that snuck in. Honeysuckles are another one. We talked about a good honeysuckle that will sort of maintain itself. And then we have one called Halls or Japanese honeysuckle, the vining form that will absolutely take over. So think in terms of watching those plants in your landscape. The vines are great, but if they get off to a really good start in a place where you don't want them, you're going to have them everywhere. We do hope you'll enjoy trying some of those great vines. With that understanding, you're going to have to train, prune, and maybe rogue some out. And you have some vines to talk about for your pictures, Rock. Uh, the first one here is uh, bindweed. And the second one we think is a morning glory. And both of these viewers are uh, wondering how you uh, would control bindweed and the morning glory type thing. Right, the one that looks like an arrowhead is field bindweed, and the one that looks like a heart mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is, a, is a morning glory. Um, same, same general family, but different genus. Um, when they're in and amongst of the other broadleaf plants, then we gotta use the, the glove of death, um, which I think we're gonna talk about next week more in depth, but basically you put on a, put on a plastic glove, put on a cotton glove, spray that with a non-selective, wipe it carefully onto the non-desirable. Uh, you won't get much loss when you drop it back down and you let it translocate down to use something like glyphosate on vines, especially something like acetic acid isn't gonna work very well. Let it go down and let them curl up and keep on doing it and eventually they'll be gone. <laughs> okay, and they won't bring their friends to the funeral. Well, bindweed seed can stay in the soil for 60 years, but exactly. whatever. <laughs> That's exactly. a problem. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes open. All right, oaks. This is a, this is a Waterloo, Nebraska viewer. It's a Regal Prince, which is one of the, one of the new cult of, newer cultivars. He has two of them. They're both three years old. One is fine. The other is showing that yellowing, and then it's sh he's showing the leaves. One's good, one's bad. And then lots and lots and lots of this. So what do we have going on yeah, here? So the, the crinkling of the leaf margin, you see with the dark discoloration and the overall distorted growth, uh, that's anthracnose. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that in our oak trees quite a bit. Uh, this is something that a fungicide can be used to manage. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can get some twig dieback with anthracnose. So mm -hmm. uh, particularly if they're establishing the tree, mm -hmm. um, I would recommend looking at using uh, one of our landscape fungicides to help. And, and is the timing now on that or? It would be better to have done it early, earlier, yeah. uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and, and with it, so next year, I would look at making a fungicide application earlier in the season. All right. In the early stages of leaf development. And then you have uh, a tulip tree. This is a three-year-old tulip tree. Um, some of the leaves are turning this, only a portion of the leaves. He's wondering, is this environmental or is this disease? And we did yeah, talk about yeah. a tar spot. Yeah, and unfortunately in the leaf that I'm looking at, I can't really say that's yeah. tar spot. So I, this, there's so many things that can cause a leaf drop that it's really hard to tell from one leaf uh, with that. So I'm, I'm gonna, I hate to say pass, but 
that yeah. one I'm, I just don't want to commit on something like that. Okay, all right. So, John, uh, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, your first couple of, of pictures are from a viewer. Uh, he's planted for 38 years tomatoes. He's never had a problem. Planted both heirlooms and hybrids. He pulled them all out and planted 12 new because the new growth was curdling and extremely narrow. Uh, he thought maybe it was weather, new plants are doing the same thing. The only thing he did differently, he used grass clippings for mulch and um, he did spray spectrocyte a couple of times last year. So is this herbicide or is this not? It could be, so there is another issue going on with tomatoes that we'll mm -hmm. talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some symptoms that could be going on that are similar with all these. So we get the curling leaves with herbicide drift. We typically see distorted stems and some weird growth going on. So if this could be herbicide and that spectricide, if it's what I think it is, like a lawn treatment, it's sort of like a stew of several different herbicides. And so that mm -hmm. could have been, you know, some residual in there. So that could be a possibility. So you could try to take that off and see if it happens again. Unfortunately, if it's herbicide, uh, you think that that's the problem, you probably shouldn't save the tomatoes. You should replace them right. again. Right, and then th the other one was the, the curly top. Right, question. the other one is uh, called curly top. We've been seeing this a lot uh, in Nebraska and other states. I don't know if we're going to have like a tomato epidemic uh, going on as well, but it's a viral disease. It's caused by the beet curly top virus which spreads to all different kinds of plants. And um, we see just these curling of the top leaves. We thought it was weather related beginning uh, when we had all that rain, but it's continued. So we think it's this virus. Unfortunately, there's just like a common cold, there's no cure for a virus. The plant will eventually die, it will not be productive. So you gotta pull that out and especially pull it out before it spreads to any other tomatoes in your garden. All right. It's just so the younger leaves didn't seem to be affected when I looked at that tomato. It mm -hmm. seemed to be the intermediate leaves. Mm -hmm. And generally the sort of herbicides that cause injury to tomato are gonna affect the newest leaves first. Right. So I'm not comfortable saying it's not herbicide, but I believe that, uh, that, that the symptomology that it looked like in the picture was not herbicide injury, yeah. typical yeah. herbicide injury. Yep. Okay. You know, we always have announcements of really fun, cool things going on in the gardening world. The first, of course, is still us, Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook Thursdays at 8 o'clock. We want to make sure that you uh, uh, give us your comments on that. And that's a following on Backyard Farmer in NET, Nebraska. So that's where you find us. The second is the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum's online plant store is still open until June 24th. We have their uh, URL on the screen because of course they could not do that uh, in person this year. So a couple of things in the gardening world. All right, so I think we have time maybe for a couple of questions. So Rock, um, this is an interesting one from a viewer. This is a Grand Island viewer that says, uh, we said sometime last year that at some point grass cannot or will not absorb iron via the roots. Is that true, and if so, when? Um, that's typical of high pH soils. That's, a, that's when we see iron deficiency, and, and the soil has plenty of iron, but the plant can't because it's chelated, or, or excuse me, not chelated, but tied up on the soil complex, and I'm guessing that's what they talked about, but once again, context would be great because I'm not sure what, I'm, I believe that's what we're talking about, is a, iron availability is compromised by high pH soils. Western Nebraska has way more iron deficiency than we do. All right, uh, Lauren, in a, a little short period of time here, um, ash, there's a rust that is affecting ash. Are you seeing that now? Is that why all the ash leaves are dropping in little clumps all over everything? There, there is a rust on ash and it cycles with one of our native grasses. Uh, so this would be the time of year that we would see that. Uh, and, and nothing to do right now. And I, I wouldn't worry too much about it, especially on ash, because long term they're probably not gonna make it anyway, right? Um, quick point on the tomato. Yes. Uh, we talked about with the herbicide injury and the virus. So if, if the new growth isn't affected and you have those curled leaves down, that would suggest to me the possibility of a drift event, and then you'd have new growth coming out. That would be okay. The virus would impact new growth as well as it's in the, the top. Oh, so if it's in the top, top, then that would yeah. be the virus mm -hmm. and but herbicide too, right? So I don't new think growth we answered is that good. question. Yeah. <laughs> if new growth is good, mm -hmm. it would be a drift event possibly. So yeah. just an idea. Yeah. Either way, don't eat it. <laughs> Either way, don't eat it. And, and, <laughs> Take it and out. It's not gonna yeah. look very good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately. 
for us, mm -hmm. for the tomatoes.